Okay. Okay, um, good evening everyone. My name is Celeste Kramer and I'm the Development Director at Inspire School of Arts and Sciences. Inspire School of Arts and Sciences is a tuition-free public charter high school in Chico, California that specializes in helping pursue careers in the arts and sciences. Tonight, we are hosting the first of our brand new educational series about parenting teens. This series includes one hour sessions facilitated by parents, local experts and educators with the goal of helping parents and families navigate challenging topics. There are a range of topics we'll be covering from tonight's session on helping teens deal with trauma and crisis, to helping teens have a healthy transition from middle school to high school, to building positive mental health in teens, to reaching constructive civil discourse. We are hopefully with that these web, we hope that these webinars shed some light and offer insight, making it easier to start critical conversations with teens in your life. You can learn more about the entire series by visiting inspirechico.org. The topics we are taking on during this series are things on our mind every day at Inspire, and we want to expand our work to include our entire community in that conversation. So thank you for joining us tonight for our session on helping teens deal with trauma and crisis. Between the Oroville Dam crisis, the campfire, and now COVID-19, students and families in Northern California have experienced unique and serious challenges over the past couple of years. Nationally, issues of systematic racism, civil unrest, and political division continue to impact our daily experience. Now more than ever, we are facing incredibly stressful circumstances, and we could all use the support in navigating them. Tonight, we are very happy to have Matt McLaughlin, um, Inspire's Director of Special Education and School Psychologist. In addition to be a credentialed school psychologist and counselor, Matt is a licensed marriage and family therapist with over 20 years of experience in special education and teen mental health. We have asked Matt to discuss what caregivers need to know about supporting teens in dealing with trauma and crisis. As a reminder, you will have the opportunity to submit questions through the Q&A or using the chat function in Zoom, and we'll have a, a Q&A with our speaker following the presentation. Matt, thank you so much for being here. No, oh, it's good to be here. Uh, it's nice to be invited to talk in this webinar format. I usually do this in a workshop format, so we'll give this a whirl in the webinar format. <laughs> so we'll see how it flies. Okay. Yeah. So we're well, ready to go? Yeah. Ahead. Yeah, please do. Um, I'll, I'll be monitoring the chat. So anybody who wants to ask questions in the Q&A or chat, please do. And okay. they will be confidential. Okay. So we are recording, right? Yes. Right. So the, but the um, questions in the chat are confidential. There'll be times in the, in the little presentation that I do that where I might ask for some feedback and we'll see how that part goes. Mm -hmm. But the folks can just put questions in the chat. Um, and I think about when I was asked to do this about what the state of everybody is right now. And I think it started for us in our house when, um, I'm gonna do a share screen here so I can get it going. Let me get it back here, sorry. Is when my nine-year-old, one of them anyway, got told she wasn't going back to school. So it just did not go well, she's a very social kid. And um, I think about what the impact has on them. I think about the impact it has on us. And I think about how none of us is okay right now. And originally we we're supposed to talk about like how to, how to like, you know, what is the thing that we do to the teens to help them feel better? And the more I thought about it and the more I put something together is that the only way that we can help them is to be regulated ourselves is for us to be able to um, be available to them. And I think that we, when we have kids, it's a, you know, there's a lot of part of having kids that is selfless. You put, a, you put aside a lot of you to have kids. And I think that now that we're in this place that we're experiencing a ton of stress, 
they're experiencing a ton of stress and isolation, we're experiencing isolation, and it's having this cascading effect on everybody and everything and making things very difficult to manage. So part of what I'm gonna do is I took something that I do with school staff to um, talk about what we call secondary stress, secondary trauma. It usually has to do with when you're talking about dealing with somebody else's stress and trauma. Um, but what's happening is not only are we, deal we dealing with somebody else's stress and trauma, which is our children's stress and trauma, we're also experiencing that same thing ourselves. Now, we all experience it at the different levels uh, based on how we went into this. Um, and remember, we're not just talking about COVID. Now we've got campfire, we've got the dam before that, we have the fact that we live in a community that is, has a, some of the highest levels in the state of people with high levels of stress and trauma in their lives. Um, and so this is something that's been building for a while and COVID is like the next thing. So we were, in our words, we call it tuned up. Like we were already having difficulty and then now COVID happens. And so it just is something that pushes us even, we're more easily teetered over is the best way to put it. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna start to talk about the, we're going to talk about the stress response, like what a normal stress response is. We're going to talk about um, how we manage that. We're going to talk about ways in which um, we, we can respond. We're going to talk about knowing ourselves and how to respond. And we're going to talk about ways in which we can get ourselves more regulated and in turn our kids more, like, more regulated. We'll put it through the lens of what's happening to us, the lens of what's happening to the kids. I'm thinking we'll probably do uh, sometimes Celeste seen me present before, probably hopefully, hopefully 30 to 45 minutes. It's not a workshop, so I don't have people to talk to, so it might go a little quicker. Um, so we'll kind of go from there, then we'll take some Q&A at the end. Is that about time-wise, time-wise, Celeste? Is it about the time we have? That sounds great, okay, yes. Cool. Um, okay, the stress response continuum. What we want to do here, um, and I only have one screen here, so instead of doing the presenter view with my notes, I'm going back and forth with notes in front of me, so I apologize for looking down. Um, we. Having stress is a normal part of life. Predictable stress, right? Patterned predictable stress in particular that is manageable is the thing that builds resilience. So one of the worst things we can ever do to our kids is to protect them from all stress. If we do that, you're actually making it so later in life, they can't deal with any stress or because they haven't learned to do it. Um, and that can be, the best way to think about it is like, you don't go out, and run a 10K tomorrow. You first start by running short, little bits, little bits, little bits. First you get off the couch and then you move and move and move towards that race you're gonna run. Well, the fact that all those things that you're doing to lead up to your race are predictable and patterned are part of what makes you able to run the race. And that's what we call a positive stress response, right? So a tolerable stress response is when we're starting to become a little, it's a little more stressful. I'm gonna use the running metaphor, but just where you're asked to run a lot too quickly or somebody or your boss hands you something to do and you, like even this right now, the tall stress response for me, I'm used to doing this in a workshop format where I have a lot of back and forth with people. Um, it kind of helps things, helps things go, helps us know how I'm doing. Webinar format is different. So the stress level for me, if you have me do a workshop, the stress level for me is very, very low. But now doing the webinar, it's a little higher because I'm not totally sure how it goes. The webinar format, I'm going to ask Celeste a lot of questions and how it works. Um, I just realized, Celeste, I cannot see the chat. So that's on you. If yep. No, I'm monitoring stuff. it. It's yeah, great. Thank you. All right. So um, anyway, that's a trial refresh response where our response goes up. We're able to manage it through our strategies. And then we get back down what we call baseline. But the toxic stress response is when our ability to manage our natural response to the stressor, the strategies we have are outweighed by the stress itself. So a classic one would be, you know, a car accident, right? So everything was fine. And then that particular stress response, that event can be so intense, it leaves an indelible mark on you. Um, those are called single event traumas. What's happening here is that we have had multiple events over a long period of time where we are never able to reestablish our baseline. So we're staying up high 
for long periods of time and eroding our ability to manage the stress. And so there is a cascade of things that happens inside of our body physiologically and then mentally has cognitive impacts, has social impacts, which we're going to talk to in a little bit. But that is, a, that is the body's natural response to a prolonged stress that we do not have the ca capacity to deal with. And that our ways in which we normally deal with it, spoiler alert, other humans, has been taken away from, by COVID. Um, it's one of the many reasons like the social isolation is just so difficult for people. Okay. All right, again, this is a originally um, geared towards some teachers, but we'll still use the phrase students. Um, I'm not gonna do a detailed neurological training about how the brain's set up, but I am gonna do a basic one. You can always Google um, uh, David Siegel hand model of the brain. You can watch his video on YouTube, it's great. But the gist of it is, right? that our brains are organized from the bottom up, right? And the inside out. And to use the hand model, can you see that, that work? Okay. We have our brain stem down at the bottom, right? Controls things like automatic things like respirations and heart rate, temperature. You have your limbic system, the middle part, controls things like emotions, connectedness, those sorts of things. And then we have our cortex, right? Which is on top. And it's, make sure I get it right. It's roughly oriented like this, okay? So when you are well-regulated, your cortex is connected to lower parts of your brain, okay? Where it is, one way to look at it is the lower parts of your brain wanna do crazy, nutty stuff all the time, right? Or it wants to check out and leave. It wants to get up and dance a jig. But your cortex is what keeps a lid on it, right? And, and literally keeps a lid on what is happening and controls your behavior. And one way to think about how that works is think about the emotional regulation of a two-year-old. Not very good. They just say and do and they have tantrums, right? Well, that's because the cortex isn't very well developed in them at all. Uh, it's just, it's kind of, they're, you know, barely, you know, monkeys at that point. So they're just unable to control their behavior. Well, what happens with a, with a stressed out adult and a teenager is what's your lower parts of your brain have permission, right, from the whole system to be able to basically take over, right, to protect the system. So your cortex is actually far slower to process information than the rest of your brain. And that's, that's a whole nother training to get into long details of that. But what happens is as soon as your brain experiences what it perceives as a threat, it activates these lower parts and turns off your cortex, right? which is why you get in, let's say a fight with a significant other and you're arguing and afterwards you go like, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. Well, because your cortex wasn't on, right? So what um, Siegel talks about it is it's like a cliff that you're hanging onto a cliff. And as soon as you let go of the cliff, you're falling. It's not super slow. You can go from fully regulated to out of your mind really quickly, okay? So, um, what we want to try to do is both with ourselves and with the kids, our own kids and the kids we work with at Inspire, is we're trying to get those cortexes to get reestablished that connection. There are lots of ways to do that. There are some activities we're going to talk about, but the primary way we do it is in relationship to other people. When we're connected with other human beings is where we tend to be the most regulated and the most, and the most grounded, okay? So we're trying to shift right, from what we call our survival brain, lower parts of our brain, to our learning brain, which is up here. So when somebody, uh, so another metaphor is, um, it's like a rider and a horse. So this is the horse, and this is the rider who steers the horse, right? But when the, right, when the rider falls off the horse, if you're talking to the person with, this is off the horse, you're, you're excuse me, when the rider's falling off the horse and you're still talking, you're talking to the horse. You're not even talking to the rider. A rider's gone, right? Again, if we want to do another one of these, I can do a whole thing on brain stuff. But that's, this stuff is fascinating. But just to know, for all of us right now, our ability to stay connected is impacted. We're tenuous at best. Our connections, and this is neurological, our connections are, are not as strong as they have had been. We are, um, like I said earlier, easily tipped over 
when we think we're regulated, everybody's had this thing with their own kid where they throw a tantrum or they're ticked off at us or we have a fight. And then we re-engage them a little too soon or maybe we make a demand on them and then they lose their mind again. Well, they weren't back yet, okay? So that, again, is a whole other training, talk about you know, that type of regulation. But we have to know that this is having a profound impact on the way that we control, we're able to control our feelings, control our emotions. All right. Okay, so we're gonna do this shot and see if people in the chat can do this. Let's talk about how stress is manifesting right now. So here's the deal. Stress will manifest and take essentially three different forms. And it's kind of progressive. One of the first things we experience is cognitive impacts. The cognitive impacts are where we maybe don't think straight anymore, or we have a hard time remembering stuff. I know with my, with other colleagues and my spouse, we call it COVID brain, where somebody will just ask like to remember something. And I say, I have no, it, there's a link sent for this webinar and at 610, I had to text Celeste, like, where's the link? I have no idea where it is. So I know she sent it. It just isn't in this COVID brain. So there's stuff that like, we have very little room for lots of cognitive load. And so we're starting to forget stuff. Um, you'll start to have things like, uh, like new ideas that you might have just sound like more work. Right. Instead of like getting into like, I'm going to do this cool new thing. And I, I, I have said even pre COVID, but essentially in COVID that I who have had years of training in this stuff would, would actually do a robust, like chore chart and reinforcement system for my kids. And then when COVID started, I'm like, I got to do this, got to help out the family. Okay. So it's January, 2021. And let's talk about whether Matt has done that yet. Not so Go ahead, Celeste. I was going to say that's helpful for all of us parents to know that we're all in the same place right. <laughs> and to be forgiving of ourselves. Yep. And that's, that's yeah, the, 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 the self-compassion, which we'll get to in a little bit as well, is really hard to have. And I keep, kids had a freak out about cleaning their rat cage today. They wigged out. Kids wig out about a lot of stuff. And we got irritated with them. And it was just was this fun little dance that we did. And then we got to have a reconnection with them, which we can get to that a little bit later too. Um, but yeah, we're, it's, it's very difficult to do, to take on new things right now. Um, let me see. We'll tend to hyper-focus on things that are easy, okay? Because we can't handle things that are hard and we will just pick one thing. And people do this normally, but especially now is that mine is I'll do email. Because I can just go through email right? That's a little easier versus like, okay, I have to write this thing or schedule this thing or coordinate these multiple pieces. We will naturally start to avoid those things. Um, and what tends to happen is that we either immerse ourselves in watching media or reading about things that are happening in the world, or we're totally checked out of it. That's what I tend to see. I mean, again, it's never that binary, but that's why I tend to see those two extremes where we, you know you're, you're in a really rough place when you cannot tolerate any of it, okay? Well, you, you're just checking and you just, you don't wanna watch a video of anything. You don't wanna see any of it. Um, that just kind of starting to, is a, is a symbol that you're starting to start to cut things off. Um, the next thing you have, you can have physiological signs. Stomach pains are a common one. Um, crying easily is a common one. Um, it's more of a signal that something else is going on because it's like leak. We actually literally in therapeutic models, we call it leaking. But actually, you could say the client came in leaking because it's like, it's like you're, I know it's a, it's a funny term, but the reality, that's really what we're doing. We're just trying to keep it together. Um, you can have eating, either eating too much or eating too little. You can be tired a lot beginning headaches. And that one of the big ones is sleep disturbances. We'll get into later. I'm not gonna do a presentation on tonight. I have some links that we'll send out. I mean, we'll paste them at the end about sleep hygiene and those sorts of things. Um, and you, you, you'll be confused pretty easily. And the other one is behaviorally. Like you can actually can have um, like uh, back aches. Uh, you can totally isolate and stop talking to people. Um, or stay super busy all the time as much as you can without having to sit still. Those are some common things. So maybe in the chat, we'll see how it goes. And if not, I'm gonna make Celeste do it. Um, out of those areas, how is stress manifesting? 
for anybody that wants to share and talk about it. Thank you. Psychologically, behaviorally, physically, cognitively, what sort of things are they starting to see? Either, and it also could be with themselves or with, with your own kids too. Well, I can definitely relate to this one. Someone wrote, um, I just want to watch a movie. And you know that joke when the pandemic started where Netflix pops up and says, are you still watching? And someone wrote, of course, we're still watching. <laughs> I never saw that, that's funny. <laughs> that is how I have felt <laughs> from the beginning. Right. Um, someone said the kids are just wanting to stay in their rooms. Isolate, yep. 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 Um, For sure. Forgetfulness, crying easily are some of the responses, okay. hiding out from things. Yep. So, yeah. That makes sense, okay, mm -hmm. for sure. The, uh, again, the, the crying easily also has some other stuff with depression, but um, one thing that uh, Celeste has heard in some Inspire trainings is that, um, I know that everybody has different levels of isolation that kids are experiencing with kind of how locked down the families are, but kids, developmentally teenagers, they're, one of their biggest developmental needs is independence, privacy, right, and peers. And what if, in COVID anyway, what have we completely taken away from a lot of them, or at least it's impacted? Some kids are in more lockdown than others, but it's been impacted. And so the idea that, that some kids will isolate and go in their rooms, lock those in the room, in some, again, case by case, it's going to be different. Some kids, they're trying to like assert their privacy because having privacy as a teenager is normal developmental um, impact, normal developmental thing they have to do. Um, but it, this is like part of what we'll talk about when we do probably in the Q&A is about that piece where how do we know it's tipped over into a big problem? And um, that isolation piece, um, I think we, I think we, as we kind of move towards the summer, hopefully get kids back into some routines that, that have some direct contact with other kids um will be helpful anything else in there celeste oh just having 50 ideas at once oh yeah, yeah. not uh, unable to filter mm -hmm. yep yep that makes sense feeling tired someone wrote bought a lot of pjs <laughs> which is now our new work attire so i'm not sure there's a oh, yeah. problem with that uh <laughs> so oh, be, yeah be, because this is recorded so i can make my wife watch this <laughs> my wife is watching Call the Midwife is their thing. And I keep talking to her about like, is this relaxing to you? Because it's mostly a really cool period piece followed by intense pain and disruption. And in some ways it's like, oh, that makes complete sense. Oh, what's going on? Like, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was wondering that too, because I've, I've gotten really addicted to criminal minds and every mm. time it gets over, I think I shouldn't be watching this. And then I turn it on again. And I, I'm like, I know I can tell myself, you right. know, not to, and I still do it. And um, yeah, it's interesting. Right. And I think making our individual assessments about whether something is soothing or I think my wife, I like to make, you know, my wife a hard time i think it's a checkout for her like it's a period piece and she gets to just not and she just watches this thing she knows the story she knows the characters and she's into all of it so it is it's a mental checkout for her mm -hmm. and for me i have we have our online poker group that plays poker with the buddies that's kind of the, one of the main things that i do so i think we all have our thing i think when it becomes maladaptive when it isolates us so much that we're not doing the other parts where we're connecting um and reaching out to other people Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see what we're gonna do here. I won't get a ton into this. Um, we get into there's because there's stuff that is biologically happening to all of us, right? About the way we're showing the APA HPA axis. I think it boils down to this for the purposes of this is that you end up with a physiological response, right? driven by your pituitary gland. And there's another link that I'll send out for a lady that describes it way better than I ever could as far as how, how this happens, a medical doctor talking about it. But you end up with a lot of cortisol in your system from the stress and the kids do as well. And there are ways in which your body can respond to the cortisol. And for, I think for our purposes right now, the big one that I see 
is that the cortisol is an up chemical. So I think seeing sleep disruption is the, one of the biggest difficulties. And it talks about regulating mood and, um, and just the, how we go about responding to stress. But I find sleep disruption, um, typically less sleep, but it can be hypersleep as well um, as being a huge piece of this chronic stress that happens all the time. But it actually starts to have um, other areas of the brain impacted from the stress we'll, we'll get to in a little bit. Okay. The, the thing that can start to happen when you're in chronic stress is you're feeling burned out. Like basically the, I can't take it anymore, right? Where you just you used to be able to handle stuff you can't handle anymore. Um, and then this feeling, which I, this is a new term to me about, about six months ago, I don't know where somebody coined it, just they call it a feeling of overwhelm, like as a noun versus being overwhelmed, um, is this idea that it's just all too big for all of us. Um, and I think we're all burning that, the kids and us, and we're all trying to find our way through that. But that has an impact on us neurologically where we start to shut down some of our thinking like we talked about. It starts to actually have an impact on our brain's um, production of oxytocin, which is a bonding chemical because we're not connected to other people. And this is a, a fun one. Which I don't think I have a slide for it later. Make sure I don't repeat myself. But um, it's a cool one because uh, that oxytocin bonding chemical is part of what we get when interactions with other people. Same thing you have with a little baby, but it's also when you have a, you know, have a really good conversation with your teenager or with your spouse or a friend, um, that's that, that, that bonding chemical. When we don't have those interactions or the source of the bonding is now a source of pain, which if maybe you used to have a good relationship with your teen and now they're not there anymore, or your, you know, your relationship with your spouse is not the same, you're isolated from your friends, that, that actually um, is painful to us. And your brain actually releases an opiate to that part of the brain to numb the pain, which is why you free, one of the most frequent things you see with somebody that has been far down this road, they'll start to say they feel nothing. And, they, and they see, they'll even see something very objectively painful or hear something from this objectively painful. And they'll say like, I don't feel anything about that. Like they just don't, the empathy is gone, which we'll get to in a little bit which is this one here, because I had it in the right order, Celeste. Okay, I, this, is in, this was uh, developed in PDF format with a buddy of mine. I could not find the one that is editable, so I apologize for being geared towards teachers, but you'll get the idea. We're gonna talk about empathy here and compassion. We wanna see empathy as a door, right? That is either open or closed. So is my pointer seeable, Celeste? Yeah? Okay, good. Okay, so. We start, okay, when we are normally regulated, when we are our normal selves, okay? We have compassion for others. And in this case, you know, it says children, but we just have compassion for others and for our kids and for ourselves, okay? We're kind of naturally wired that way. Um, and lo lots of ways can start to disrupt that system, but we are wired for connection and to be with other people. So then when we have compassion, right? That yields empathy both for ourselves and for the other person we're interacting with, in this case, teenagers. Well, they sense that and they know that you're regulated and that you care, so then they share. And I'm sure people have had, most of us have had experiences typically with kids where they'll share something with you when you were not expecting it, what was going on. Um, where they just, in that moment, they felt like they could, um, they felt safe in that moment, and they were able to share but they'll most often share when they feel connected to you or that you have empathy for them. But here's the thing is that when we get a lot of that, right? A lot of the sharing from others, this is, again, this is, this is geared towards teachers. Um, but in this case right now, the pain is everywhere. It's on the media, starting with, you know, campfire all the way up to the present day of last week. Like there's just lots of stress, the media, you know, what is the media's bias? It's not left, right, it's sensationalism and conflict. That's what they like, right? So if you consume a lot of media, it's just, a, it's just building that in, right? So that just keeps coming and more and more information, more and more pain coming your way. Well, eventually you start to take it on, right? Because these things or either a cause or a kid or a spouse or a friend used to have a lot of empathy for them. 
Well, it's a natural human thing. We start to take that on and we start to experience, um, it's, we take on their pain is the best I can describe it, right? Whether it's the pain of what, what of the campfire or something happened last week or your kid alone in their room, COVID isolation, we start to take that on. And that's where, that's where, that's where the, there's only one way to survive in that circumstance, right? Because that's where the empathy, door, the empathy door, excuse me, was open when we took on that pain. But unless we have a way to manage that pain, there's one solution. Got to guess, Celeste? Shut it. You got to shut the door, right? So then in order to survive, we cut off our feelings from ourselves and for other people, and we no longer have empathy for others, right? Um, in extreme forms, it's extreme, extreme forms that we actually have a, have a questionnaire for this we use for people that work in um, fields where they're dealing with other people's feelings constantly. In extreme forms, it looks like um, I just don't care anymore, right? It look, and it is, it's, it's correlated with depression and those sorts of things, but it gets to where we start to numb out, we'll withdraw, and we just no longer have empathy or care anymore. And we just act in accordance. So these people in work settings are the burnouts that you've all seen in work settings where they're just fried. They never have good ideas anymore. They're just pissed at everybody all the time. They're complaining constantly. Like this is, this is, this took place. Cause what this takes place over time, guys, this is a slow process. And here's the crazy thing. You don't know what's happening to you. You don't know what happened until you're already here. Right. And then, um, the fix for it is connection to other human beings, which we'll get to that in a little bit. Any questions so far? Just much time on this. Anything coming up in the, in the chat? No, but as you were talking about it, I realized some of the things that you were talking about is it's it's hard to differentiate that between a normal teenager what they go through anyway. Yep. So it's really complicated with teens because they're kind of like you'd kind of describe as sort of being kind of all over the place, like that sort of, yeah, you know, so it's interesting when you talk about what, you know, some of the things to look out for. And I'm thinking, oh, that's some of those things are just kind of normal teen things too. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the, I think what I would say, tell me this is getting into what you're asking is that, yeah, this original slide in the, in the, this, we're focusing mostly on us as the caregivers because I mm. firmly believe that we cannot help them unless we are connected and regulated. Right. You just can't. You just can't. So mm -hmm. we get in school systems and all, not just school system, but in systems that we do these consultations in, the system wants to always ask us, tell me what to do about problem X. Tell me what to do about in school system is what I do about the kid doing A, B, and C. What do I do about this problem in the system and we as the consultants come in and go like, okay, we'll get to that. We can't do anything until you're able to do this. So that's why I, I went this direction and we'll talk about some specific mm -hmm. stuff at the end. It'll feel like small potatoes to people, but just know that you, it's the whole, like, what do you, what do you do when the, when the, in the airplane, when the oxygen mask comes down, what do you do first? Mm -hmm. You're supposed to put it on yourself first before you do it to somebody else. Right. Okay? We do. Well, and since March too, the parents have become also the teachers. Oh yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so, and yeah. we have cut them off from their normal ways of providing their own regulation and right. put them in this position where here, by the way, here's the perfect way to feel helpless and incompetent, mm -hmm. right? Like right now, you know, I'm trained in mental health for 20 years. When I ask me to drive a truck tomorrow, it'll be a joke. Like I can't do it, right? It isn't, it's like we're being asked to do things that are beyond our capacity. So back to your original thing, I think the kids do a version of this, but like their mood, they zip in and out of it constantly. Like the, uh, most of them have very little, um, like they just don't have as many resources than we do. So they, I think they get despondent and um, hopeless more quickly. And they also could be pulled out of it at the hint of maybe something good happening. They get their hopes up and mm -hmm. then something doesn't work out and then they crash again because it, so like they just, they're just more um, uh, it, just big, just in my own COVID brain. Just their, their ups and downs are, are greater 
um, probably as, as part of their neurology and their age. Mm -hmm. And if, the, the, if we're not regulated, it tends to get worse. Okay. All right, so that's capacity fatigue. These are some things that you might be experiencing if you are in secondary trauma, okay? Loss of purpose, emotional roller coaster, withdrawal isolation, disorientation, apathy, anger. You guys are getting the idea here, okay? Uh, make sure I don't miss anything here. Pardon me. Here's some quotes here that um, a few parents actually told me. I eat in a hurry, I do everything in a hurry because I constantly, whoops, sorry, typo. I constantly feel like I must do the next thing in order to keep everything afloat. I'm frequently amazed about my lack of patience with others, especially my kids. Things I used to be able to handle make me irritated and terse. We won't talk about whether any of these are my wife. Um, okay. Oh, I can't see it. Let me make sure I can see this. All my energy goes into just getting through my days. I don't meditate anymore or write. That's what I used to do at night. I don't do anything anymore, but try and manage the basics. I feel like a bad parent. Yeah, this is just a few. Um, I know going into this, I kind of surveyed it, just texted a few friends and said, give me a summary. And that's, this, this was uh, very quickly, they came up with this stuff. Okay, whoops. Okay, let's shift gears, not shift gears. We're gonna head down this thing. Now we're getting into like, the, what do we do stuff, guys? Okay, um, how are we doing time-wise, Celeste? We're good. We're good. We're good. Yeah, okay. this is great. All right, cool. All right. So um, we're going to talk about the responses to fear, because remember, if you were in a therapist's office, one of the things they would talk about is drill down to this fear or need that is not being met in this context. And we're not here to do that. But we want to talk about it in terms of the way we are responding to fear, because when your brain does this, it's because your, your lower body is threatened, okay? So it's a form of a fear response. So there are four different ways, roughly, that we can organize how we think about how we go about responding to fear. We have fight, which we all know about that one. Attack, move towards it, we tend to be angry. We have flight, we're like, see ya, peace out. I'm just gonna leave this entirely or just hide from it. And that the emotion is we just tend to avoid those things. We have freeze, which is we get super compliant and shut down. Um, sometimes it involves like literal freeze, but sometimes it's just, we just do things and don't say anything. We just comply, comply, comply. Um, and then we have face, which we actually turn and face the threat, okay? But in that, we are connected to our emotions, right? And we are maybe defend, you know, to be defended and uh, we're able to engage and deal with the threat in a reasonable manner. So, we're going to use that with this. Okay. So we'll use this as a teaching tool. So these are four different ways to respond as in this case, we'll talk about it as a parent. So now this right now for the second guys, we're only talking about parents. We're going to put the kids, we're going to talk about dealing with their behavior. And this is also dealing with your spouse or your significant other or anybody else you're dealing with. Okay. We have the do twos. Okay. These are the fights. These te this is when we tend to be punitive, right? And this tends to be authoritarian. This is our response to that fear and stress. Okay. So think about your, something has happened in the environment or your kid is being a kid and doing their thing. And this is your response. Okay. When you're under threat, we do two, which is the um, punitive one. We do not, right. Which is neglectful where we just, just don't do anything. Right. The one I use the example I use in school all the time is the, the kid who's a total pain and doesn't come to school anymore. Um, but, you know, people are not quickly rising to like make sure to get that kid to school as fast as possible. That they're just so stressed out that they're just like, ugh, like this. A good one for a parent would be um, just not stepping in when you should as often maybe. Not just letting stuff slide that you shouldn't be let slide because you just don't want to deal with it anymore. That's probably a better example. And to do four is where you just basically do it all for them. Okay, so um, we'll use, I'll use a perfect example how it works on my house, right? My natural, again, I think I should say this first. Few of us do just one of these, okay? We will tend to move back and forth on one of them. Through this, as you're sitting here thinking about it, I hope that you can think about what is your primary thing that you do? 
what people report when I do this training is they frequently identify one as their first response, but then they have something they slide to afterwards. Okay. And so I'll use me personally, my first response, and it is, it is, there's a gender bias here that's somewhat biological, but is I, I do too. Okay. I will tend to be a little more, um, when I'm stressed out, I'll tend to get terse and want to punish. Right. Um, I'll t when they wouldn't clean their rat cage today, what came out of my mouth was if literally I said this guys, if you guys don't get this rat cage clean in 30 minutes, every other animal in this house is gone. Now that wasn't really going to happen. And I immediately said, daddy doesn't really mean that, <laughs> but like, but we know we've all said those sorts of things. I had this one parent in a meeting a long time ago where the general ed teacher turned to the parent after the meeting and said, why is Johnny saying he can't have any candy? And the parent said, because he wouldn't get his shoes on. And I told him he can't have candy for a month. Right. If he doesn't, if he doesn't get his darn shoes on and, and he's like, she's like, I said it, I have to do it now. So that's an example of do two, like you just want to punish. Right. So do four is my wife tends to do. This is her go-to when she gets stressed, she will start just doing it for them, picking their stuff up. She hates to have her, you know, she does not like having a, a messy house. I don't either, but she's way better at it than me. So she'll like, she'll go around and pick stuff up, right. Uh, or clean things and just without doing it with them, which we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, another example would be like uh, homework, you know, kids asking you for homework help you like it's the answer is 30. <laughs> just here's your answer. Cause I'm just done doing this now. I can't take it anymore. So that's permissive. Right. And, and we talked about the do not. So before we get into the do whips, maybe in the chat, um, cause it's confidential, right? Yeah. If people want to put in the chat, which one they think they are. I personally am due to, and when I get super stressed, I do not, I just check out. See ya. Bye-bye. I'm not talking to anybody anymore. That's me at my worst. And I have a deal with my spouse when she sees that she speaks up cause that's not a good thing for me. I'm um, in a long term. Um, but you may want to, what, what do you, what types of things are you starting to see there? Celeste? Permissive. The four. Oh, the do fours. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, so far, that's the only one. So, oh, really? <laughs> and I'm the same way. I'm always thinking, well, I'll just empty the dishwasher instead of asking them to. And yep. then I justify it in my head with, I can do it better anyway. <laughs> oh, I, I, I have nine year olds. I literally told my wife, like, they suck at everything. Mm -hmm. So, after the little cage got cleaned up today, the kids swept, right? And they put it away and then literally my wife was in the other room. She didn't know. She came in, grabbed the broom, swept it all up without saying a word. And I'm like, you know, the kids just did that. Not that, again, it's okay. But the fact that you don't, like what we're moving towards is where we're actually know that we're, that we're doing it. She right. just swept because she's like, they suck at it. So I need to make sure and just do it because it's terrible. Um, okay. One person wrote too, and I think this yeah. is also something I've experienced is, more permissive because it feels like life is extra hard right now and i think oh yeah i think sometimes i do the same thing like oh i have a senior who can't step foot on campus this year and i'm gonna ask him to put his clothes away yeah. I, I i go there sometimes and that seems to be yep. what other someone else's does too yep so one thing i don't want this next thing i'm going to say or the next topics uh, to response and uh, to be like a shame thing. So like we are all in this place. I, that's why I kind of tell the stories about, you know, I have like three degrees and went to school forever and I screw this stuff up constantly. Right. So I will, I don't have a slide on this. So I'll use this time now to talk about it. Let's make sure I didn't include that slide. No, yeah, we did. So I want to talk about connection and repair a little bit. Um, when do you want me done by Celeste to start taking Q and A? It's fine. Just keep going. Fifteen okay. minutes or so doesn't matter. I think this okay. is great, and 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 this is wonderful okay. information. All right, we'll do this quickly then. And again, this could be a whole other training. So one of the things that happens when we make one of these mistakes, right? And do two, we or these sorts of things, especially to do two one. By the way, guys, because that's the that's my go to. Um, it has an impact on the people in our, in our environment and it, it can damage relationship. Now in isolation, 
they're usually no big deal. You slough them off. You're like, whatever, right? And people get over it. But when it happens repeatedly, right? These all have consequences. So the do too, right? If you do it repeatedly without a repair built in, the kid will start to be afraid of you. Literally afraid of you. They'll just avoid you because you're not a safe person anymore because daddy's a jerk or whatever. So daddy's mean, whatever. So you, it's not that you are going to avoid being, you know, getting mad sometimes. It has to be coupled with re-engaging with the kid. You know, every situation is different. This is, an, you know, ideally to be able to come to them and talk about what happened when everybody's regulated. Okay. And I have a whole nother training on this, right? About, it's like a long thing. Um, where we talk about the details of how to have that conversation, but um, in a short, what it is, it's coming to them and owning your part without excusing theirs of what happened. And usually my go-to is like, it's daddy's job because I have little kids, daddy's job to not get super mad at you in that situation. I'm not explaining to them about why the daddy, you know, I'm not doing that. Like, and I'm sorry, I got irritated. It probably didn't feel good to you. And what, and now what they do, they usually say like, it, we've trained them to say apology accepted and then say they're part of it. Right. Teenagers might just bounce off the like, talk too, too cool for school. Like you didn't say it. Well, we have to deal with that. Right. And that could be, if, you know, usually, usually the, the fact that you're coming to them and just apologizing for your part, not for the whole thing, because they play up, they play a part in like, they said the thing that made you snap. Right. They still need to take responsibility for that. And sometimes you can't get them to do it, but we are responsible for our part. And when we, they see us regulated and saying and, and owning our part is an invitation to them to engage with us. They may not do it that time, right? They may not do it the 10th time, but they may do it later. At least they see an, an adult acting like a mature adult owning their stuff with somebody else. Um, that's the do too. It can result in kids um, being afraid. So you need to do those, we call them repairs. We have to do those repairs in order to keep the relationship going. A lot of people probably already do this. Repairs frequently can be in the form of something funny. I have a kid where if you, that if you just be silly with her, it gets what it's, that, that, that's, the, that's the, your ticket home. Get her to be silly and she'll come out of that weird place and then be able to engage with you again. Um, the other one, if you're silly with her, she literally looks at me and says, stop making fun of me. She gets super mad. So I, with her, I have to do it differently. Like you have to kind of read, everybody has it, their kid individually is going to do it differently. So um, the do nots is where the kids just end up lonely and isolated. If that's our go-to is we just let them and don't engage with them at all and just let them be in their room forever and do nothing. Um, that just has an impact of neglect where the kids feel unloved and the world is not something that can love them, frankly. Okay. Again, we're talking about way down the road of lots of it happening, right? So if that's your go-to, sounds like permissive is the go-to. So here's the big one for permissive. It totally works. <laughs> it gets every, it gets, it reduces your stress in the short run. It's great, right? It's like needing to, it's like coffee in the morning when you have the caffeine, right? It's super effective. You're still a caffeine addict though, right? Didn't change that. So what it does is, is it robs the kid of the feelings of self-worth that come from learning to do something for themselves, okay? That doesn't mean that you don't sometimes still do it for them, right? But if, you're, if that's your go-to all the time when you're stressed, that's the, that's the end thing that happens, right? Then you end up with these kids in college that have no idea how to like get car insurance or right? whatever, like those sorts of like, like we want to have that now we're back to the beginning, that manageable stress that is predictable, that builds resilience. Well, that's this, is allowing them to, to do things and um, in, particularly engage with you while they do them, right? Can, can help them learn that they're capable, which leads us to the do with. Do with is what we're all going for, guys. And you will not, even not in COVID campfire, damn everything, View County, you will not do this all the time. It's like not human. Okay. We want to strive for it. It's a goal we want to try to keep in mind, right? That whatever the thing is you're doing, 
you try to do it alongside them or with them, right? And that could be putting the clothes away for, especially for a little kid, right? Who doesn't know, like my kids, my, you know, I've, my neighbor actually just told me, my wife was complaining about, you know, I, you know, we fold the laundry and the kids just mess it up. And my neighbor went like, I don't fold laundry. I stick it in the thing and go put it away and hand it to them, right? And so, and my wife is like, like twitching at the idea of like the wrinkled clothes studs in the thing. But on the flip side of it is, it's their clothes, you know? Like, so anyway, that, that's, a, that's the thing that, that's kind of trying to be negotiated. Um, do with is also solving a problem. So if you have a kid that's isolated in their room, right? And, they, and they're still able to talk, it's getting, sitting down with them and observing what is going on and trying to solve the problem together versus get off your computer and your finger wagging them or whatever it is, right? Um, Versus, versus getting them to, to agree with you that there is a problem that needs to be solved. Until the kid agrees with you that there's a problem to be solved, there's no problem to solve because they will just fight you, right? Until they agree that it's a thing. There's a book, oh, I don't know if memory, COVID brain's like, well, let me do it. I'll put it in the, in the links at the end. Um, Ross Green is the author. Hope I'm getting that right. Ross Green. Um, something difficult child, I forget what it is, but like he, it's a, it's a cognitive model, I'm not talking about nurtured heart. This is something different where it, he lays out a whole model for how to do this, about how to basically join with kids in what the problem is, and then you guys solve it together. Um, anyway. Hope that explosive makes child? Yeah, that one, the explosive child. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, you don't have to have a super explosive child to benefit from that part of that book. Just know that he wrote it for kids, for parents with kids that are completely out of control, okay? Uh, but there's parts in there about joining with kids on what the problem is that are really helpful. Okay, all right, we did that. We're not gonna do that at a time. Okay. Okay. What, what is the way out of this thing? Or the way to relieve some of this stress? And it's each other, it's connection. It's being able, it just, I should say this guys, when I do this one live in a workshop, here's the assignment. The assignment is pair up and first think about a time that you did your thing, right? And now think about how that felt, right? What it was like, what the body experiences was and what your feelings were like. Now turn to your partner and express and talk about that, but you cannot talk about the details of what happened. You can only talk about the feelings. It's really hard to do. And most people, when I do it live and say most, a lot of people ignore it. They can't do it, right? Because we're mainly because I'm partnering up with strangers, but like they, or, or at least we're just coworkers. They may not have that relationship with, but the, one of the keys through this thing is being able to share about what is happening inside us with other people. I'm not talking about your teen. I'm talking about other parents and other adults right now. Okay, now we're talking about regulating us. And for the teen, yeah, it'd be great if they talk to us, but other kids are even more powerful than us. Okay, being able to have that time to talk to other kids about how they're feeling. So in this case, in this context, I'm talking about us and the way we talk, sorry, the way we're talking about what is happening with other people. So in schools, what we do is we do dyads and triads where we put the staff all together to where they are then accountable to one another for um, check-ins, for kind of knowing each other's stuff and how it works, um, those sorts of things. If I was doing couples therapy with somebody, we would set this up between the couple. They would get to know each other's um, triggers and kind of how this works around parenting and then try to build up the capacity to be, able to, to be able to talk to each other about how it feels when Johnny is doing A, B, and C. This goal is not to get Johnny to do Y. The goal is to be able to make us more regulated so we can even deal with what Johnny is doing. Because currently, if we're not regulated and connected, when we go to deal with Johnny's problem or Jane's problem, we're gonna make it worse, okay? Is that making sense, Celeste, as far as the thing? Okay. Yeah. So 
you can put it in the chat if you'd like, or just I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it. Who are your community members? Who do you feel connected to? Who do you feel like you could make a deal with and say, hey, I need a partner where we have an agreement that we're not just going to not, we can do some of this, but we're not just going to get together and talk about how, how the world's screwed up and it's all burning down or, you know, our kids are awful and our, and we're not just going to bitch, excuse me, about everything. They're right going to get together and we're going to, I'm going to do a little bit of that, but we're going to start by first talking about what it's really like for us. What is really happening? I feel, right? What this is like for me. Um, and answer those questions, then you can plan if you want, if it feels like appropriate to complain about that and just to vent and do those sorts of things. So take, some, take a minute and think about who are your people? Could be a spouse, could be a friend, um, could be another relative, could be a neighbor, porch time, that kind of stuff. Um, and I think what I would encourage is to see if you can maybe make a deal with somebody where you're able to once a week, every other, you know, a few times a week, have this conversation. Part two of this deal, if you choose to do it, is you let the other person know what your go-to is and how they will know that you're doing it. Remember the compassion fatigue, guys? Whoops. Remember this? You don't know when you're down here. Okay? So if somebody is alerting you that you're doing these things, you're preventing sliding so far down the road that the only way to heal is to disconnect from everything, which is a whole nother thing, right? Um, so you would then make a deal with them that they actually can, can say to you, hey, I noticed that you're being a little, for, for my wife and I, she has permission, obviously not when I'm actively mad, that probably won't work, right? But they able to go in a normal time, like, hey, I'm noticing that you're a little more ticked off lately with the kids. Or I'm noticing you're more terse with me. You're more critical. Those sorts of things. Now, again, I'm not saying I'll be all perfect about that, but I've given her permission to do that because we're trying to prevent the thing where I check out, right? And now I'm working 10 hours a day. Oh, how'd that work? You know, and those sorts of things. And then your own go-to. So you discuss that with your partner and then you are able to um, have somebody you're connected with. One of the comments, Matt, and I was thinking about this too, is how did this community change with the pandemic? And I was thinking to myself, right. my community shrunk very, very quickly, but the people that are in that community are very meaningful. Yep. And someone wrote, um, I have been Zooming with good friends and have actually seen and talked to them more than I did before the pandemic. So I don't know, maybe that's one of the positive things that come out of this whole <laughs> craziness. I think, I think, yes, to answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, okay, full disclosure, I'm not, a, like, um, I'm not a fan of doing like Zoom therapy, right? Mm -hmm. I don't like it. My wife can totally do it. I don't like it. So she's a social worker, by the way. Um, I think for some people that mechanism of connecting with somebody works. Like, I guess it could work as a means, not for me. I have to have porch time with somebody live and be distanced in this context, or I have to talk to my wife. So I, I, I think there's something about the in-person inter interaction that is different personally. If you feel like that you're able to have community with other people um, via Zoom and other means, I would just add the other piece where you're being um, very um, deliberate about how much time, or sorry, about talking about this particular topic and specifically about your feelings and your personal and describing your experience. Because most of us can get on Zoom and shoot the bull with the best of them, especially now after doing this for this long. And we can sit and be on friends for Zoom. We have, we have family Zoom every Sunday. And it's mostly catching up and that kind of stuff. There's no vulnerability in that family Zoom, right? There's tons of time. I spend more time talking to my family than I ever have. But there's it, the same way my family has, oh, has always operated is still operating on that Zoom. We talk about stuff and we all get along. There's not a lot of real conversation going on, right? So I would just see, I would look at your, what your interactions are and whether 
there's some intentionality going on or invulnerability and the ability to be vulnerable with other people because that's how we get connected and how we get regulated. And then ideally, we're able to engage with our team and be able to do some of those things because we're more regulated and we're fostering those things. Does that answer that question, Celeste? Yes. Um, someone else made a really good point too that they use Zoom for work, so they need a break from screens. And I, I yeah, I get that. I think you and I both get that, Matt. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I think, again, that might be somebody who's a little, you know, I would just, if you have the ability to have a distance, again, whatever's safe in your current situation, um, a distance interaction, and also get off Zoom, use the phone. Mm -hmm. Right. Just Someone said that they actually went back to writing letters, like old fashioned, oh, write, cool write letters, which that's a fantastic cool idea. idea. <laughs> I never thought of that. It was a great idea. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to, that's wow. Uh, there's actually a, a teacher at Inspire that I think, if I understood it correctly, she's co teaching a class where they're doing a, um, you heard it, maybe you heard it today, Celeste, during staff meeting, where they're doing a uh, pen pal thing with some kids in Israel. Right, so that's gonna be writing. Right, that's a really cool idea. I got to write that down for my own, my own notes to make sure to get the right elements in my own house to be able to do some of that. Anything else, Celeste, from that? Nope, I think we're good. Okay, let's make sure I get to my first one. Okay, I'll put a link to. Oh, let's make sure I get some. To, uh, that's kind of this. Uh, we just kind of already talked about this. Um, part of if you do decide to do this piece, you want to develop a plan for how you're going to go about doing it, whether it's a weekly contact, um, a scheduled thing with this, with the people you're going to be supported by. Um, that's the accountability partners part. Uh, time for them to check in. You're kind of letting them know what works for you and what you like, um, which leads us to some strategies to do with our kids in particular. So there is a thing um, that I'll put the link to that, um, this uh, guy's kind of the, the grand poobah of all this regulation stuff, a guy named Bruce Perry, um, talks about kind of an eight point thing for like a COVID survival thing for parents. And I'll put a link to it. Um, if you look uh, in our shared doc, Celeste, I put a link to a few of these things in there. You probably saw it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the eight points. Again, some of us are probably doing some of this well, a lot of it not, and we struggle on a day to day basis. Again, we're talking in an optimum situation. We are structuring our day as best we can, having a routine and structure to our day, getting up at the same time, um, adding some sort of movement to the day, having a routine and structure. Start, do your best, do family meals, particularly dinner, okay? The modern family, I forget there's some data out there that shows like it's a fraction of what it was in the past. And there is some studies around the family connectedness and mealtime. So if you can do that is try to restart or do more often for us. Like we don't, it's impossible to do it every day. We didn't do it tonight. Um, if I think a goal is a couple times a week, if you're not doing this at all, no family meals, everybody's in their room eating their Cheerios out of a bowl or a, you know, whatever they're doing, um, cooking together and um, family meals, even, even if it's just on Sunday night, once a week, right. Um, is a huge plus. Because during those family meals is times to connect and talk, right? One of the things that, um, that we've done as part of the routine is that we go around, go around the table and people talk about a uh, name, one or two things that they're grateful for in general. And it can be something that happened that day, something in their life, because gratefulness is actually is like a, a true gratefulness, not the one you phone in, right? Where you're actually noticing that you're actually grateful for that thing is like one of the antidotes to depression in general. Um, that, that's an, uh, one of the things we do around the table. And this other one that was given to me by somebody else recently, which was fabulous, which is, again, you have to do this dependent on age, but you go around the table and you pick two other people at the table that you, they have a character trait that you admire. What is that character trait and why you admire it? And then pick one character trait about yourself that you admire. And talk about that and everybody goes around the table just while you're eating it's not that you know not waiting to eat while you're eating, just chatting and you're trying to make it a time to connect and be less intense 
um, as far as like, you know, I have conflict, that kind of stuff. You're trying to create dialogue. Um, let me see. And you, if you Google that, like meal, you know, meal time, you'll get to come up with way more than that. But those are a couple that we've used in my house and it's worked really well. Uh, another one, the Perry talks about is limiting media, which is really hard when you're in Zoom school all day. Um, but I think really trying your best to make a deal with your team and have a conversation about what media is doing. Um, if anybody hasn't seen um, the Netflix documentary, um, the name Celeste, I know you know it. Um, I'm in COVID brain, it's late. Um, but the go social, ahead. was it the social? Social, di social dilemma. Yep. Right. Watch that with your kids. Right. Talk about it. Mm -hmm. That is a, that's, it was, I, mandatory viewing for kids and teens. Now they may just, mm -hmm, and just brush it off if they're really being crappy about it, but you want to try to show them some openness to discussing that like media is an essential part of our lives and it's very, very useful, but mm -hmm. we also need to get away from it because it does this other thing to us. Right. And we're actually, what do they say in there? Like we are, we're the rats in the experiment, right? But that's a whole nother discussion. Um, exercise, trying to do some sort of exercise, whether it's standing up and um, stretching, going for a walk, which is hard when it's colder outside, but just getting some sort of physical movement during the day. And again, we're in the do with guys. This isn't going to your team, go get outside and exercise. It's like, no, we are going hiking in the park. You and me are going to up monkey face and we're going out like that. Do it with them. We are biking to downtown this weekend or whatever it is, whatever you decide to do, whatever works for your family, try to get some physical movement going. Um, he has the reach out one, which we talked about, which is reaching out for other people, um, helping others. So if you're able to have the capacity to do so is add in an element of helping somebody else. Um, I was, I, I was, I, my daughter has been obsessed with this modeling thing that she's doing. She's doing clay and stuff. And the models she's creating, she's in the room, are totally terrifying. They're super scary. But because she's nine, and it's hilarious. But anyway, she just wants to give them all away. And she also made little clay cats. Um, and these cats, she put every one of them in a little clay cat bed wrote a note with a name on them and wanted to take them to the senior center to give away to all the seniors who are not allowed to have pets. Okay. I have twins. One of them is nice. There's the other one. So um, the other one just wants to solve math problems all day. So, um, but anyway, so the other one, we do other things, right? Like, you know, they, we picked the Mandarin tree and everybody got a, a bag of mandarins in the neighborhood, like that kind of stuff. Like you're trying to do things that get that, get us and them outside of here to realizing that we're part of a community that's outside of our room and our house. And that it actually, there's all this, um, this uh, dopamine you get from doing that giving piece. Um, sleep hygiene. And I did not put it in our, in our doc. I couldn't find the one I want to do yet, Celeste. So I don't know how we're going to send that out or put, maybe I can find one quickly. It's uh, the main sleep guy that I like to read is Matthew Walker. Any podcast with him in it is great. Um, but he does all kinds of stuff, like everything from like, that's super technical. He has a book, Why We Sleep. Um, sleep hygiene is a whole nother thing, but the gist of it being my favorite, my top for sleep hygiene is having a nighttime routine, no media and screens of any kind within two hours of bedtime. So raise your hand if you're doing that. Okay. It's, it's 740 right now. You know, so like we need to get the hell off of this thing. So anyway, sleep hygiene, having as much sleep, good sleep hygiene as you can um, and staying positive and future focused. Like at those meal times, talking about the future, talking about after the vaccine rolls out, talking about, we, we did, one of our things went around, like we asked the kids, what is the thing you cannot wait to do when you're able to do it? And they're like, I wanna have a sleepover. I just start naming these things. They're really looking forward to like, this is coming. Like this is not forever, this is coming. Um, let me see everything else I wanna talk about. I think I'll, I, it might be a good time to end unless I, I probably forgot something in my notes. Um, that's actually, that, uh, that is not as appropriate now because of what, because this came from a, a trauma related thing. But what I will talk about is the second part. Well, I'll say it this way. The hurt and relationship from this training is a lot of, from this slide rather, is a lot about when kids are like actually in us, we get hurt for by other people. But in this case, the hurt is the isolation. 
Okay. That's, that's the in relationship. It's from the lack of is where the hurt has come. We heal from re-engaging, re-engaging with our teens, re-engaging with ourselves and with each other to find a way to be supported. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Matt. There are some questions. Uh, um, if you have the capacity to hang in there for a little longer. <laughs> well, I just, yeah, we'll give it a shot. One person was saying, um, how can caregivers or parents make time to listen when the teen wants to share at the last moment of the day instead of earlier in the day uh, when they feel like they can handle it better? So I don't know if you have any suggestions for that. So this is when it's everybody needs to go to bed and they want to talk about real stuff. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that I would, when I hear that, first off, totally. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a thing. I think that you have to, there's a foundation. The response you're gonna be able to pull off is gonna be based in a foundation of what has happened prior to this. So if you have a foundation based on that you have a history of making repairs with this kid, their relationship is going pretty well, that they're able to, that they trust you, that they feel that you're a reliable source of information, like all those things, then you might be able to say like, what you're saying to me is extremely important. I want to hear it. The thing is, is that I am right now not at my best. And I feel like if we go down this road, that I'm not going to be able to be what you need to be right now. Is there something we can do? Can you write something down for me so I can read it in the morning? Can we, can we make an appointment tomorrow morning at this time? We're going to have this conversation. That's if my first thing is like, can I muster up the ability to do it? If my kid is engaging and wanting to talk to me, I'm going to do my best to do it. And if I had to stay up late to do it, I'm going to go to my spouse and go, and you got the morning I'm sleeping in. So cause I did this other thing. So if I, but if I really can't do it, I think the, the transparency of leadership I think works in both organizations and in many elements of parenting, not all of them. What is the thing? I lie to my kids constantly. So like it's, but like with, especially with teenagers, they see through that stuff. So they, I think transparency is a, a good go-to. Um, that's kind of how I, I would play that. I would, first thing is I would try to try to muster up the energy to do it. But if I absolutely can't do it, or if the kid does it every stinking night, it's like they're in therapy, we call it doorknob therapy. It's like on the way out the door, they lay something on you and then walk out and you're like, whoa, like that kind of thing. It's usually, there's usually an element of, I know I don't have to really, like my parent can't really do this. So I'm going to lay it on them. So I don't really have to do it because they're going to, they're, they're going to be frustrated and I'm going to leave. I don't have to really do it. So just naming what's happening. I'm noticing that at night when you're trying to go into sleep, you're starting to tell me stuff and it's a little late and it's happened a couple of times and you are so important. I really want to hear about this. Can we set up a time to talk about this? I really want to hear about how so-and-so texted you that and it really hurt your feelings. I want to hear about it. But we, it's like this every night at 10, it's not good for us. We need to sleep and you start getting into those things and just always bookend with, but how important you are. And I'm so glad you talked to me. You want to talk to me about this. It's one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. These conversations are one of my favorite things. Okay. The other question is, can you recommend any books to help teens deal with their friend's suicide? <laughs> That's a heavy one. Not off the top of my head. I don't have a book off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, as I was talking to a colleague, as I was kind of prepping for this, and um, one, of, one of his things at the top of his list was, there are ways to know whether your teen needs help if they ask for it is the number one. Like if they ask, it doesn't matter whether you're going like, you're fine, what's the deal? Like, no, they talk to somebody. If they're asking, they get to go do it. Let the therapist and them figure out whether they really need it or not, if they ask. And then if they are in a place where they're unable to see anything good, right? You as a parent may have to initiate that um, contact with an outside source. I don't have a book that I can think, I will go ahead and ask some friends about that. I do not have to talk mad. I have a book to recommend to you. Okay. Um, if they, if you don't feel they're dealing with that really well, if you cannot, we can up, can't find a resource that they feel is sufficient to meet that need. I would recommend they talk to somebody. 
-hmm. even if it's short term, just to be able to uh, try to talk to you if that doesn't work. Because, you know, you, you want to know what their questions are around that. And you, you as a parent may not be have the capacity to answer those questions, right? Maybe you're, you as a parent, you can, you can uh, you know, be tuned into the affect, you can be there for them, but they may ask details that are mental health questions that you, ca you can't answer. And that's okay to tell your kid, like, I'm not, I'm not a counselor. Let's find those answers together. Let's think about the best way to find an answer to that question. And that might be a therapist, that might be looking at something online. Um, but I don't have one offhand. I will, mm -hmm. I will do a little asking the colleagues, but not one in particular. Okay. Um, I think that's all the official questions that have come in. Um, let me just, just scan here for a moment. No, I think that's it. And I will put, I put all those resources that you, um, gave to me in the chat as well. And then I want to let everyone know, too, that next Tuesday, we're also Dina Ward, who has worked at behavioral health or in the behavioral health field for 30 plus years, is going to come on and talk about how to improve your teen's health. And I know she talks a lot about or is going to talk a lot about the outdoors and doing those things in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. And so she's going to come on and talk about um, how do how do we get the teens to do that? Um, how do we encourage that? Um, and talk about some of those resiliency. Uh, yeah, I have so a really cool yeah. study. Oh, just to kind of leave this little nugget leading mm -hmm. into that one. The study that was done on comparing the effectiveness of medication for depression. So these are people that were depressed enough. They were not leaving their house. Like they were really hard to get moving, doing anything. These are adults. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they had two groups. I think it was two. It might've been a control, but uh, the two treatment groups, one got medication and some talk therapy. And the other one had peers, two or three peers show up in the morning, right? Like a certain time in the morning and to go to a walk for 45 minutes. I think it was maybe an hour to all together as a group, follow them up six months later, the walk group was as good or better than the medication group for depression. Yep. It's about, it's about that, that combination of connectedness and physical exercise is huge. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's, it's a big piece. Yeah, I've noticed with my own, I have two teenage sons, when we go for a walk, it's so interesting because they often ignore me and talk to each other, but they don't stop talking. It's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. I don't mind being ignored at all. Yeah, just observe it. <laughs> yep. And then the other thing is we just got a hand-me-down hot tub and all of a sudden we get in that hot tub and they just open up. It's like these floodgates of, right. of connectiveness. So... <laughs> Um, but I think, uh, I think that's it, Matt, unless you have any closing remarks, but if anybody mm -hmm. would like to join us next week, um, please visit inspirechico.org. We have a section called learning inspired that you can register for next week's session. And Matt, I can't thank you enough. Good you luck. are phenomenal speaker. And we are so lucky to have you at Inspire. And our students are so lucky to have you at Inspire. So Good. I really, really appreciate you being there and everything that you do for them. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad I was invited. It was great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you to all of our attendees and we'd love to see you again. All right. Peace out everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.